Noam Chomsky is the only thinker in this series who is still alive and active. He was born in 1928, so he's closing in on the age of 100 years now. Most viewers will be familiar with him. He's been an iconic figure of the American left since the 1960s. As a linguist, Chomsky's been the most prominent proponent of universal grammar theory. Very broadly put, this is the hypothesis that language is not a merely social or cultural construct, but at least at some foundational level, innate to human biology. The idea is that language is based on genetics and almost a priori common to all humans. I will not discuss linguistics here, but there's some compatibility between Chomsky's universal grammar theory and his leftist political positions, even though he denied strong connections, as you can hear here. Again, I would be very pleased to be able to discover intellectually convincing connections between my own anarchist convictions on the one hand and what I think I can demonstrate or at least begin to see about the nature of human intelligence on the other. But I simply can't find intellectually satisfying connections between those two domains. I can discover some tenuous points of contact. The tenuous point of contact Chomsky mentions here, may refer to the fact that universal grammar theory has an egalitarian element. It's anti-racist and undermines cultural differences. This made it compatible with the civil rights movement in the US, which Chomsky has been supportive of. At the same time, universal grammar theory is a type of Anglo-American positivism. It leans towards empirical science, and in this way it differs from grand social theory like Marxism, or social constructivism, as in postmodernism. Generally, Chomsky belongs more to an Anglo-American left than to the postmodernist continental European left. And this is clearly obvious in Chomsky's famous debate with Michel Foucault from 1971. The video of the debate is highly recommendable, much more substantial, I think, and less of a personality contest for that matter, than, for instance, the Peterson versus Zizek debate. Foucault was a postmodernist, post-Marxist social constructivist. And he focused on developing a grand historical and theoretical critique of sociopolitical power. Chomsky, on the other hand, has a much more pragmatic focus on concrete social justice issues, rather than grand theory. He's interested in the pursuit of empirical truth even if there's no absolute or final truth for him. He's quite moralistic as well. Chomsky views US American style capitalism as unjust and repressive because it produces and maintains inequality. Nationally and globally, he thinks US capitalism politically controls, economically dominates, and militarily suppresses people. His aim is to work toward a more egalitarian, just society, but he doesn't claim to be a very original political theorist in his own right. Chomsky self-defines as an anarchist or libertarian socialist. Well, I mean, I, I think that uh, what used to be called centuries ago wage slavery is intolerable. I mean, I don't think people ought to be forced to rent themselves in order to survive. I think that the Economic institutions ought to be run democratically by their participants, by the communities in which they exist, and so on. And uh, I think basically through various kinds of free association. There are small societies, uh, small in number, that have, I think, done so quite well. And there are a few examples of large-scale uh, libertarian revolutions which were largely anarchist in their structure. Uh, as to the first, small societies ex extending over a long period, I myself think the most dramatic example is uh, perhaps the Israeli kibbutzim, uh, which for a long period, may or may not be true today, really were constructed on anarchist principles, that is, of direct worker control, integration of agriculture, industry, service, personal life, on an egalitarian basis with direct and in fact quite active participation in, in self-management, and were, I should think, extraordinarily successful. Throughout his life, Chomsky has been championing 
radical libertarian positions, especially regarding freedom of speech. He publicly defended freedom of speech even for Holocaust deniers. And he spoke out against certain illiberal practices of today's so-called cancel culture, such as preventing right-wing people from publicly speaking. If you don't like uh, Charles Murray giving a talk, the wrong way to deal with it is to break up his meeting. It's wrong in principle and it's a gift to the far right and to him. The right way to deal with it is to set up a counter uh, meeting in which you talk about what he's saying, use it as an educational opportunity, uh, everyone gains from it. If you break up the meeting, you're saying you're giving the right wing an opportunity to say, we're the good guys, we have to protect ourselves against these thugs over there. Like other old school leftists, he's been critical of identity politics or wokeism insofar as it neglects underlying class issues. Class issues, which are right at the center of all of it. If those get effaced and you are just working on your own identity and how you feel about things, it's going to be harmful. Central to Chomsky's sociopolitical critique is his critique of the mass media. He views Western mass media, and especially U.S. American corporate media, as a major propaganda instrument. Like in totalitarian systems, in democratic societies too, the mass media are the most important tool for keeping small elites in power and for preventing any anarchist or socialist uprising. To describe how the mass media function as a propaganda tool in liberal democracies, Chomsky co-wrote a book with Edward S. Herman, published in 1988, Manufacturing Consent, The Political Economy of the Mass Media. The book consists of two components. First, an empirical analysis of how U.S. mainstream media report on political themes like the Vietnam War or politics in Latin America. Second, a theoretical model to explain how mass media work in liberal democracies, and this is his so-called propaganda model. There is a three hours documentary on the same topic available on YouTube, and we've been using some bits of this video here. As mentioned, Chomsky acknowledges a difference between the mass media in one party states where the media are directly controlled by the government and the mass media in liberal democracies where they are, at least in large part, privately owned and run. In communist one-party states, mass media are openly embraced as a propaganda instrument. Propaganda is and was not a bad word in China or the Soviet Union. The function of the mass media in communist states is to ideologically educate the masses. In the West, however, propaganda is seen as something bad. The media are supposed to be free, and therefore they shouldn't be used as a tool for state propaganda. In Western democracies, like in Germany, for instance, publicly owned and government regulated media are typically required to be objective and impartial. However, and that's Chomsky's main point, mass media and liberal democracies are actually not free and impartial. Instead, they are manipulated behind the scenes by the political and economical elites. There is this massive effort to try to control and manipulate behavior and understanding. Although Chomsky calls his theory of the mass media a propaganda model, this is terminologically not really precise. He doesn't argue that mass media in the West function like the propaganda media of totalitarian states. Instead, he argues they are manipulated by the elites. His model should therefore be called more precisely a manipulation model. The question is whether privileged elites should dominate mass communication and should use this power as they tell us they must, namely to impose necessary illusions, to manipulate and deceive the stupid majority and remove them from the public arena. 
Chomsky implies that Western mass media need to be liberated from elite manipulation. And we'll get back to this aim at the end of this video. Here's how Chomsky explains the title of his book, Manufacturing Consent. Manufacturing Consent. What is that title meant to describe? Well, the title is actually borrowed from uh, a book by Walter Lippmann, written back uh, around 1921, in which he described what he called the manufacture of consent as a revolution in the practice of democracy. What it amounts to is a technique of control. Uh, and he said this was useful and necessary because uh, the common interests, the general concerns of all people, elude the public. The public just isn't up to dealing with them. And they have to be the domain of what he called a specialized class. First of all, the phrase itself comes from Walter Lippmann, the leading public intellectual of the 20th century. During the First World War, the United States, Woodrow Wilson, had a problem. He was elected on a peace platform, but he was determined to get the United States into the war. So he had to find a way to turn a passive population into a raving uh, anti-German fanatics. Succeeded, incidentally. One of the ways in which he did it was by setting up a commission. It was called the Committee on Public Information, the Creole Commission. And the idea was to try to carry out this transition. Two of the members of the commission were Walter Lippmann and Edward Bernays. Uh, Lippmann put it, the public are an unruly mob. They don't understand anything. So for their own interest, you have to manufacture the consent so that they will be passive and obedient and will recognize that their role in the democratic society is to be spectators, not participants. They're allowed to show up every couple of years, push a button for one or another of the responsible men, and they go back to passivity. So that's manufacturer's consent. Edward Bernays, who, as mentioned here, inspired the concept of manufacturing consent, worked in advertising for major American corporations and for government organizations. He's famous for the first woke advertising stunt in history, the Torches of Freedom. He staged a feminist demonstration in 1929, paying women for publicly smoking with the hidden aim to promote cigarette sales. He also worked for the United Fruit Company in the 1950s supporting the USA in overthrowing the socialist government in Guatemala to secure the business interests of American corporations there. Edward Bernays is personalized evidence of Chomsky's idea of the simultaneous use of the media as a manipulation tool by corporations and democratic governments. He's a predecessor of today's presidential election campaign managers, who often work both in business and politics and bridge corporate and political marketing. In the 1920s, Bernays and Walter Lippmann openly proclaimed the need for manufacturing consent, that is, intentional, scientifically informed, guided mass manipulation by experts and specialists working for the government and for corporations. Chomsky's theory is basically a response to Lippmann and Bernays. And Chomsky's main points are the following. First, elite-guided mass media manipulation has been central to the functioning of capitalism in liberal democracies. But second, that's illiberal and non-democratic. Third, what is needed instead? A truly democratic, anarchic mass media within libertarian socialism. Domination-free mass media in an open public sphere. Fourth, Chomsky pointed to small, diverse local community media, like radio stations or magazines, as examples of providing quality information and serving as a forum for public debate. And then fifth, however, these media are suppressed and instead mass media function 
as outlined by him in the propaganda model. The propaganda model, which, as mentioned, is actually a manipulation model, focuses on five filters used to select information and brainwash people. The first filter is size, ownership, and profit orientation. Media information is produced by large privately owned corporations, which constitute a sort of monopoly. They are in alliance with the political elites and marginalize small, individually or collectively owned anarchist nonprofit media and keep them from power. Second filter is advertising. The main sources of revenue of corporate mass media are not the receivers of information, but advertising. The media companies primarily serve the interests of the advertisers, not the consumers. The third filter is sources. News reporting relies on corporate news agencies and official government information. This information is often generated by spin doctors. Journalists receive information secondhand or ready-made. There are few neutral sources of information. Investigative journalism is limited. The fourth filter is flak. Flak is a military metaphor, literally meaning entry aircraft fire. Flak are actions by governments or corporations to prevent or dismiss bad press, for instance, through legal, political, or economic means, or through media campaigns. Prominent recipients of flak today are Julian Assange or Edward Snowden. The fifth filter is anti-communism, or fear. The first edition of the book was published shortly before the end of the Cold War in 1988, and anti-communism was still the leading ideology of reporting then. In more recent editions of the book, the anti-communism filter has been updated to fear, the spreading of negative images of dangerous enemies of the USA, like Saddam Hussein, Islam, or more recently, China and Russia. Here's a summary of the propaganda model. A propaganda model traces the routes by which money and power are able to filter out the news fit to print, marginalize dissent, and allow the government and dominant private interests to get their messages across to the public. The five news filters are the essential ingredients of the propaganda model. Here are some further notes on these filters from a contemporary perspective. Back to the first filter, size, ownership, and profit orientation. In his analysis of elite media, Chomsky says, Now the elite media are the sort of the agenda-setting media. That means the New York Times, the Washington Post, the major television channels, and so on. They set the general framework. Local media more or less adapt to their structure. And they do this in all sorts of ways, by selection of topics, by distribution of concerns, by emphasis and framing of issues, by filtering of information, by bounding of debate within certain limits. They determine, they select, they shape, they control, they restrict, uh, in order to serve the interests of dominant elite groups in the society. He's also, or even especially, critical of progressive, agenda-setting elite media. The emperor's uh, lapdogs like the New York Times. In Chomsky's analysis, it makes perfect sense for the capitalist system that its mainstream media are somewhat woke and that, as a sort of left-wing neoliberalism, or a fake left, they express a certain liberal bias. Uh, in fact, if the system functions well, it ought to have a liberal bias, or at least appear to, because if it appears to have a liberal bias, that will serve to bound thought even more effectively. In other words, if the press is indeed adversarial and liberal and all these bad things, then how can I go beyond it? They're already so extreme in their opposition to power that to go beyond it would be to take off from the planet. So therefore, it must be that the presuppositions that are accepted in the liberal media are sacrosanct. Mainstream fake left media like CNN or the New York Times suggest to viewers that Biden is okay, so that Sanders can be avoided. Or in the UK, like a BBC or Guardian, they suggest that a mainstream woke Labour Party is fine, and thereby they subvert a more radical 
potentially dangerous leftism as represented by Jeremy Corbyn. The second filter is advertising that funds media. This funding constitutes a symbiosis between advertising and news. This symbiosis has been extended today to include entertainment and politics. The new Barbie movie, for instance, as we discussed on this channel, is a perfect example. It functions simultaneously as advertising for big corporations, Mattel in this case, and it sends a fake left neoliberal political message. It's feminist and wokeist, but within a very capitalist context. And it offers fun entertainment and thereby distracts from actual politics, like, for instance, the war in Ukraine. Another example is the woke CIA ad we also discussed on this channel. It advertises a government agency while propagating progressive neoliberal political messages. The third filter is sources. In a recent interview, Chomsky says this. First thing I do in the morning is read the New York Times or Washington Post. It used to be mostly news. Now it's more columns and opinion. News today often comment rather than report, or they disguise comment as reporting. Today, when reporting on, let's say, China, the report will often not just present the facts, but also create certain desired narratives by referring to often unnamed experts or critics. The journalistic function here is not to report just the facts and then allow viewers to form their own interpretations of the facts, but to present the facts along with the opinion the viewer is supposed to adopt. The media operate in the mode of second order observation. They don't simply observe information, but observe how this information is or ought to be observed by the general peer. As to flack, the fourth filter, Chomsky's claim is that it is stronger in the US than elsewhere. The United States is ideologically narrower in general than other countries. Furthermore, the structure of the American media is such as to pretty much eliminate critical discussion. I'm actually not sure that this is still the case. In the US, for instance, there are both left and right wings of neoliberal media, like CNN and Fox. They represent the two mainstream political parties and the culture wars that are going on between them. My impression is that, for instance, in Germany, the media spectrum is much narrower. There's little dissent on central issue in German mainstream media, for instance, on the EU, on the war in Ukraine, or in China. At least in my perception, there's been a lot more political diversity on German mainstream media a few decades ago. But now differing opinions, for instance, on the war in Ukraine, are subject to a lot of flack. A good example for fear, the fifth filter, is a significant shift in the reporting on China in Western media. Here, a very successful narrative change took place. In the 1980s, along with China's capitalist reform policies, the Western media developed a hugely positive narrative on China. But this narrative has been completely turned around, especially since Trump's trade war against China. Now a new yellow peril narrative dominates reporting on China. Not just the China virus, but Chinese politics, the Chinese economy, the Chinese military, and even Chinese students and Chinese language, like Confucius Institutes, all seem somehow dangerous and an urgent need of de-risking. Well, Arguably, a sixth filter has emerged with the emergence of social media, direct government interference, and open censorship. As to the rise of censorship, one personal example. I remember when I was a student of Chinese in Germany, still during the Cold War, Chinese communist political propaganda journals were openly presented in the library for students to read. Now, in the context of the Ukraine war, major Russian media outlets have been banned in Germany. The banning from TV and blocking on the web seems to be widely supported by German media and the German public. To be clear, 
Chomsky's propaganda model is not about new media and social media. As mentioned, the book was first published in 1988. But Chomsky is still alive and has been commenting on new media. But that didn't change his model much. Generally, Chomsky seems to appreciate the anarchist potential of social media, but he shares most of the common criticisms, like corporate control by Facebook or Google, surveillance capitalism, the dumbing down of information or social fragmentation resulting in mutually exclusive bubbles. Chomsky's media theory presents a pretty stark contrast. On the one hand, there is systemic mass manipulation that has the whole population in its grip. When we talk about manufacturing of consent, whose consent is being manufactured? We, we can, to start with, there are two different groups. We can get more into more detail. But at the first level of approximation, there's two targets for propaganda. One is what's sometimes called the political class. There's maybe 20% of the population, which is relatively educated, more or less articulate, uh, that plays some kind of role in decision-making. Uh, they're supposed to sort of participate in social life, either as managers or cultural managers, like, say, teachers and writers and so on. They're supposed to vote. They're supposed to play some role in the way economic and political and cultural life goes on. Now, their consent is crucial one group that has to be deeply indoctrinated. Then there's maybe 80% of the population uh, whose main function is to follow orders and not to think, you know, and not to pay attention to anything. And they're the ones who usually pay the cost. Manipulation brainwashes the political class, the 20% of people who think and who actually need to be brainwashed. And it makes the remaining 80%, those who follow orders, compliant. They can simply be distracted by sports or entertainment. Even the journalists, the brainwashers, are brainwashed themselves. Most people, I imagine, simply internalize the values. Uh, that's the easiest way and the most successful way. You just internalize the values and then you regard yourself in a way correctly as uh, acting perfectly freely. All right, let's get to the White House now, where I think veteran uh, correspondent uh, Frank Sesno could tell us a little bit about self-censorship. That, that, that uh, inertial guidance system is always going on, isn't it? Is there any formal censorship there? Well, there's no self-censorship, uh, Reid. If somebody tells me something, I'm going to pass it on, unless there's a particular and compelling reason not to. This leads Chomsky to a conclusion that is similar to Baudrillard's notion of speech without response. In the context of the manipulation by the mass media, even elections are not really democratic for Chomsky. Well, ratification would mean a system in which there are two positions presented to me, the voter. I go into the polling booth and I push one or another button depending on which of those positions I want. That's a very limited form of democracy. Really meaningful democracy would mean that I play a role in forming those decisions and making, creating those positions. And that would be real democracy. That's not We're that. very far from that. But we're even departing from the point where there is ratification. When you have stage-managed elections uh, with the public relations industry determining what words come out of people's mouth, candidates decide what to say on the basis of tests that determine what the effect will be across the population. But, on the other hand, unlike Baudrillard, Chomsky is also an American humanist and trusts in the common sense of people. Do you believe in common sense? I mean, you're yeah, absolutely. You I do believe in, in Cartesian common sense. I think people have the capacities to uh, see through the deceit in which they're ensnared, but they got to make the effort. Like Enzensberger, whom I discussed in the previous episode, Chomsky seems to believe that, on principle, the media can be liberated, so that rather than being manipulated by the few, everyone can become a manipulator. The way things change is because lots of people are working all the time. And, you know, they're working in their communities, in their workplace, or wherever they happen to be, and they're building up the basis for popular movements which are going to make changes. That's the way everything has ever happened in history, you know, whether it was the end of slavery or uh, whether it was uh, the democratic revolutions or anything you want, you name it, that's the way it worked. Like Ensensperger, Chomsky believes in a 
participatory potential of the media. You can participate in it. You can add your own thoughts, you know, and you can learn something and so on. Well, that's the way uh, people become uh, human, you know. That's the way you become human participants in a, in a social and political system. Ultimately, Chomsky suggests that we are facing a fight between good and evil, a struggle between the manipulators and the people who have to free themselves from this manipulation. At this stage of history, either one of two things is possible. Either the general population will take control of its own destiny and will concern itself with community interests guided by values of solidarity and sympathy and concern for others, or alternatively, there will be no destiny for anyone to control. Chomsky's critique of mass media and capitalism is well justified, but its humanist narrative is not without its problem. Even though Chomsky is politically obviously very different from Jordan Peterson, his humanist assumptions are quite similar to Peterson's humanist narrative of the sovereign individual that is somehow threatened by sinister forces. And both think that common sense can lead humans out of their misery. Ultimately, for both, it's up to the people, either individually or in Chomsky's sense collectively, to rise up, affirm their agency and rationality, and to make society more democratic and more free. Chomsky notices that the Western self-description of Enlightenment humanism, of a popular democracy based on human agency, does not match reality, and especially not the reality of the mass media. As a consequence, he makes a normative demand, change reality so that it matches our humanist self-description. An alternative and more realistic demand could be change the theory so that it fits reality better, especially the reality of mass and social media. This brings us to the final theorist in this series, the radical anti-humanist Niklas Luhmann and his book on the reality of the mass media. For Luhmann, contemporary mass media are not well described by a humanist narrative focused on the notion of manipulation and the hope of reinstating common sense in its stead. Instead, he suggests understanding mass media as one of many self-maintaining social systems, a sort of matrix that construct reality and condition communication in today's society. <laughs>